Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And of course, uh, Jonathan Gray is on twice a month. Remarkable books. These are essential reading. If you're listening to the program, if you listen to me on the Genesis Network, if you listen to what I do, my usually second or third hour. Tonight I'll be on the third hour as a guest on the Rents Network. And we do, I, I could do what's called multiple updates. So basically, uh, a hit on everything that's current that's going on, and also from a Messianic Christian viewpoint. The uh, books by Jonathan Gray are probably some of the most important ones you could read outside of the Bible, along with, of course, the book that we talk about, America Plundered, by uh, Dr. Kaufman. Jonathan, your book, uh, The Forbidden Secrets, probably one of the most important works you've ever done. Uh, What chapter are we up to now? We're up to chapter 16. Yeah, I do consider this, Dr. Bill, the most important project I've ever been led to undertake. I think it, yeah. it, it's something that um, it can be life-saving, both for this life and, and the life to come. Exactly. Now, uh, it's important for people to understand that you're looking at this from a scientific and a rigorous point of view. You're also looking at it from a Christian uh, point of view, and you prove through science that, in fact, the Bible is repeatedly 100% correct that if you understand the full perspective, you realize just how brilliant the Bible is, that it actually transcends time and dimensions, and it shows a supreme intelligence, not just a superior intelligence, a supreme intelligence behind it that's not man-made. This is a, what people have to really grasp, that there's a loving God out there that has total omniscience, meaning all-knowingness, total omnipotence, all-doingness, can do anything, but he also gives us free will so that we will not be automatons. And that's why when we give a witness today and we give this book for people to read, it's very important they download it and understand that they can go to beforeus.com and many other books, find out the truth. If they have non-believing relatives or if they need to build up their own faith, these, these books are going to do remarkable things. So tell, what's the title of Chapter 16? The title of Chapter 16 is... Um Oh, now, what is, the, what is the title of it? Planet in Rebellion, Planet Earth Hijacked. That sounds like a sci-fi thriller. <laughs> and, and we're riders on this hijacked planet. Ah, okay. Riders. We're Riders. passengers. We're, we're passengers, and, and, and we've been hijacked along with the goods that we're standing on. Exactly, yeah. Sounds like that old song, Riders in the, Riders in the Storm. You know, remember that song back in the 70s? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's very really true. Yeah. So let, let's get into it. Let's uh, talk about some of the details. Go ahead. Well, um, we sort of came into an introduction of this uh, last time we were speaking, Dr. Bill. Perhaps I'll just recap a little bit for a few minutes and then go on from there. Okay, sounds good. Now, um, all ancient races remember in their folklore and in their oral memory um, the fact that their, this earth was originally created perfect. They called it, some of them called it the golden age. Others spoke of it as the age of the first people or the first age. Uh, but it was a time when um, animals were neither wild nor harmful, when there was no rivalry or enmity among men, and when there was plenty and security and harmony throughout nature and uh, this is a time of once perfect world uh, an age when suffering was unknown and this of course agrees with the the story we have in the bible that god created everything perfect he was very pleased with it he gave us um evidences of his love around us everywhere uh, and our first parents knew that uh, their creator cared for them Absolutely, they knew his love was there. But the uh, simmering rage of uh, Lucifer and his mob came in and interrupted that harmony. And by trickery, uh, he, he, he said to our first mother, Go it alone, be independent, you don't need God. He's holding from you some wonderful things that if you knew them, you'd be much better off. And uh, our first parents fell for that trick. Yeah, in fact, that, actually, that same trick is the same trick that actually led our current candidate for the Republican Party, Mitt Romney, to be not only a Mormon bishop, but a missions director at a high-level Mormon 
that does uh, in their temple recommends and their temple ordinances that does a passion play among someone in the temples, all the Mormon temples, that says, man, and this is from the Doctrine and Covenants, man must fall so he must, may know both good and evil, so he may partake and therefore become as God, which is the same lie as the lie in the Garden in Genesis. And in fact, there's Genesis chapter 3, it's the same lie that's actually... Every temple Mormon has to believe the same lie that Satan is not only the brother of God, but he actually did good by making mankind grow up to see both good and evil and decide what was good or evil in his own heart, which is the basis of evil. Well, you know, Dr. Bill, I, I have a lot of good Mormon people on my newsletter list who keep sending me, they want to send me the Book of Mormon and send me this and that, and, and they, they're so sincere, but the, the problem is that, that they need to investigate the, their religion a little deeper, uh, because there are two levels. There, there's the level of the ordinary people who are not told what's going on, and then there are those at the top who know quite well who they're well, worshipping, and it's not God. Yeah, Half of the Mormons haven't read the Book of Mormon, even if they're born in the Mormon church. If you're a temple Mormon, though, you have to get your Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood if you're male, and you have to do this passion play. And so once you're a temple Mormon, you know what the game is. Yeah, and it's the same game, as you said, that Lucifer brought into our first parents in the beginning, and they fell for it. Exactly. So if anybody says, Dr. Deagle, that's your opinion, I said, no, you're entitled to your opinion. I'm entitled to the facts. Tough luck, too bad, that's the way it is. And if it upsets you... Guess what? Being upset is the first stage, as they say, of evil and ignorance leaving your body. And it's good for us to know these things. The, the facts need to be known. We just can't close our eyes to them, because not only will it affect our lives here, but it affects our eternal destiny. And we do this, by the way, in love, because we're not doing it to just upset people because it's we want to feel superior. We do it because we feel a desperate need, like emergency doctors or a firefighter with a Scott Air Pack trying to haul somebody out of a building that's trying to pull the mask off of us, so we'll also die of fumes. Well, we take somebody that's a sack over their shoulder, try to put the mask on our face and their face, and yet they're trying to claw at us or choke us in the throat. And we're trying to tell them, if you don't listen to us, you're going to die not only a spiritual and a financial death, but you're going to die a, a, a physical death, you're going to die a spiritual death, which is the destruction of the soul. And people who think that the soul is eternal... It's only eternal if it serves the Most High God and it's your soul and the soul of the Creator, literally in a marriage, gets fused and you become a new creature, an eternal being. You are not eternal until you are a, literally a bond servant and a son or daughter of the Most High God. Your soul is mortal. That's so true. And the Bible says that we have to seek immortality. Now, if we already have it, then we shouldn't have to seek it. But we're told we have to seek it, and we can only have it through Jesus Christ. Exactly. Now, that means that you literally, the, when your will and the will of the Most High God through your conscience, the Bible, and literally walking with God, your spirit or soul and the spirit of the Most High God fuses and becomes a new eternal being, and you're no longer a mortal being. You're a, you transcend literally the dimensions of time and space. You're no longer a mortal flesh being. You're a spirit being that literally has the signet ring and the authority as a co-creator of the creator of the universe because you're a child of the Most High because your will and the will of God are in perfect lockstep. That's why Jesus said, when I return, you shall be as I am and even greater things in the Father's name. What he's saying is, there'll be many of you who will become indwelt by the Spirit of the Father. Your will and the will of the Father will become one and you'll become an eternal being as well. And even in his name, you'll do greater things than I did here on earth. So Jesus was already prophesying many, many children reproduced supernaturally as the supernatural spirit children of God, which literally in the womb of earth are being about to be delivered at the time of the tribulation uh, that's coming quickly upon the earth. And that time of Jacob's trouble is a delivery room of mankind into an eternal kingdom, which will also be on earth. Some people think they're going to be raptured away and they're going to be gone from earth. No, God's going to have a continual presence of mankind on this planet where the New Jerusalem comes down, where mankind will submit itself to the will of the Most High God with high technology, but will be in constant and ever-present knowledge of His sovereignty. That's what's coming. A new world where we return to the peace of the first world that Adam and Eve had before the lie, which is in the Mormon temple. Well, 
Welcome back, and we're up to Chapter 16 of The Forbidden Secret. The website is beforeus.com, beforeus.com, twice a month. Amazing, Jonathan Gray is on. Uh, Jonathan, tell us more about this chapter and about what what you're trying to teach people. Uh, Thank you. I'll be happy to do that. Um, You know, it it makes sense that God uh, could have stopped um, the the hijacking. He could have stopped our parents because he loved them, and he had power, all the power. But he did not make them as robots. That would have robbed them of freedom of choice and a free heart. And honestly, I do think that this must be one of the most winsome and beautiful and basic things about our Creator, His love of liberty. And so that ability to choose has been inbuilt into us, and it's the greatest power that you and I have, it's the power to choose. Well, he basically wanted to, that's why they have the analogy of the Bride of Christ. What we are literally, our, whether we're male or female, when, we're, when our will and the will of God fuses, we literally become a completely spiritually, genetically different organism. We become a literally a child of the infinite one. We become literally a co-creator of the future of the universe. And that's a very vast thing to say. It talks about us being like a midwife to future worlds around the, the cosmos. It talks about an infinite life. Yeah. Uh, it's really wonderful when you when you consider that. Now, um, I think we need to be uh, well aware. I mean, the biggest question people are asking everywhere is why? Why all this suffering? Why all this evil and suffering? Well, we know that there are physical laws that have been given so that if we jump off a roof, gravity is going to pull us to the ground. And I like to use like that, putting your hand on the fire, you get burnt. I mean, that's inevitable. Spiritual laws are likewise experienced so that if we sow, joy to others. We reap joy from them. If you treat others violently, ultimately you bring suffering upon yourself. And these spiritual laws are just as real as the physical. And so it makes sense that the basic reason for our suffering in this world is our abuse of these laws. Because we've exercised the free will God gave us to cut ourselves off from him, and that's not his fault, that's our own fault. But um, I'm not just saying something here that's just biblical. The fact is that the writings of all our ancestors worldwide tell the same story of a fall from an original state of paradise and a departure from harmony with the Creator. And whether you go to the ancient Sumerians or to the ancient Americans, the Chinese, Egyptians, Babylonians, it's the oldest racial memory of mankind, this loss of immortality caused by man's disobedience to divine law. And many of the ancient races uh, expressed it, their poets expressed it in, in poetry and hymns and songs. And uh, they, uh, they spoke about it. And so this tragedy began with our first parents, who had first lived in innocence, but they listened to the enemy's slander and they doubted their creator's integrity and they failed him. And that wrongdoing, turning their back on him, biased them against the divine law. And so now they no longer had the luxury of direct contact with him. Uh, In the beginning, it seems evident that uh, our parents were clothed with a glory of visible light, perhaps similar to that with which he communicated himself to them. And his glory would have no ill effect on them because uh, they had not sinned. But once they did commit the wrong, uh, this guilt came into their hearts and they wanted to hide from him. And that was another dreadful uh, result. The loss of their their covering, the loss of their innocence, uh, and loss of eternal life. And so death is not a natural thing. We're so used to death, we take it for granted that death's a natural, normal, essential part of our existence. But it was not intended to be that way. The Bible says that death is an enemy. It's an intrusion. It doesn't have to be. It's interesting that um, some world-renowned scientists uh, have come round to the idea that death is unnatural. Uh, Dr. Linus uh, Pauling 
uh, stated theoretically that man is quite immortal. His body tissues replace themselves. He's a self-repairing machine, and yet he still gets old and dies. Well, in fact, uh, it's interesting we're talking about that because I presented my paper to the Academy in December of last year to Las Vegas. And my theory, and I talked to Dr. Ron Klatz this morning, is now accepted as probably the most accurate theory of what aging is and how to terminate aging as a disease. And I'm collaborating with Dr. Pierre Pauly and his research. He'll be on the program in the next few weeks, who's actually developed what's called a Benjamin Button molecule. You know, anybody who's familiar with Brad Pitt's movie about Benjamin Button was born old and became younger. The age of the patriarchs is not just theoretical. They actually lived up to a 1,000 years or more. It's really true, isn't it? Yes, I, I really did. And the fact uh, and is that we what, now know that, that aging will be conquered. The very first scripture that Jesus read in the synagogue when he went into ministry, the first scripture was he said, Though a man die at a hundred years, it shall be as if the years of a child. Yeah, now, that's right. <clears throat> and the reason is that because the greatest damage and danger in our world is not the toxins from Fukushima or even the starvation or poverty or wars. The greatest danger in our world is the lack of wisdom, and that wisdom has to become from the Most High God. And without extended lifespans, without a healthy body and mind that's still vibrant at 100 or 200 or 300 years, how can wisdom accumulate in a society? You're constantly starting over again with young people who are bright and smart, but by the time, if they're in our toxic world, their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, they're starting to lose their functional capacity or they're distracted, or as it says, like the wheat and the tares, the seeds are thrown on hard ground or ground without any watering, or the physical body is breaking down, and that wisdom cannot be accumulated. Moses didn't even start his ministry until he was 80, and he died at 120, older than the so-called oldest living man right now. The fact is, the patriarchs did live 700, 800, 900 years like Methuselah, and those years were literally cut off because of a judgment, because the thousand years was the beginning of life. It didn't mean he had to live a thousand years. No, no, that, 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 that was just the beginning, really, and that, it should have gone on and on forever. It also would have changed the danger of the world. They actually did an actuarial study, and they found out that if people had limitless lifespans biologically, the average person would only live to be 475. And many would die sooner at 30 or 40 or 50 because they rock climb and they'd fall and die or they do something stupid. And some people, only one person in 10,000 would live to be 10,000 years old. And only one person in a billion would live to be a million years old. That's really interesting. Damn. That's if they had limitless lifespans. So the very fact that you could extend biological lifespans wouldn't make people live limitlessly. You might get the years of the patriarchs, but you'd have to make it a much more safe world. A world free of, of violence, starvation, stupidity, and what I call odd purposes instead of accidents. For example, having vehicles driven on the road by individuals rather than an electronic system with uh, multiple backups so the highway couldn't kill people by driving your vehicle into other vehicles, and it would automatically adjust the cars for either vehicles and the driving conditions. We don't have that. In 20 years, it'll be considered insanity that we drove on highways without cars with electronic control wired down the center of the road. But we live in a world where because we lack God, God will not extend lifespan until man repents. And we're close to that time of judgment and the time of blessing that'll follow. But the time of Jacob's trouble is coming upon us quickly. And this book is so important to read it. We'll be back in a moment. And a remarkable chapter, and of course, having a conscience, having free will, is one of the most remarkable things, because God is literally making us his children. He's literally reproducing, he's literally creating, not little gods like the Mormon gods, but children are in, in perfect alignment with the will of the Creator. And we have to understand that we will take forever to comprehend the greatness, the awesomeness, and the, not only the omniscience, omnolding, the all-loving, the all-seeing God. But as much as we would like to comprehend God, we can only get a tiny fraction of just how great God is. Think of God this great. A God that can be not only the God of our little world here on a, on a short arm of the Orion arm of the, of the Milky Way galaxy, but there's 56 billion stars that have the Goldilocks zone 
that could house a planet where God could have created life and where he could and, and there's more stars in our and more galaxies in our universe than stars in our galaxy and think of the vastness of a God that can create and know all these things instantly forever the past present and the future forever and yet our whole universe our whole universe can be an elemental particle in a water molecule in a larger universe where our creator God is still God absolutely that, amazing I mean, yeah. that gives you the perspective of just how tiny like Horton hears a who and then also understand the lovingness of God where he literally says I can count every hair on your head imagine a God so loving that in an instant he knows the the, the emotions the good the bad <clears throat> the the beauty of our inquiry and then when we reach up and realize just how great God is and just thank him say thank you God and you feel God's love, see, because we only can change people by love. Even when we get, you know, you know I, go, I call it going Dr. Deagle, getting a little attitude. It's I always do it in love because people need to know we're not doing this because, you know, we're trying to one-up people. The greatest sin on earth, and this is demonstrated by Cain and Abel, and this is one of the, why it's one of the first things that people, unfortunately even Christians don't get, is the sin of Cain. Now, the sin of Cain is that if you're a believer, that no one else can know more or have more wisdom than you have because that would mean that God's blessed them more than you. And when God sent the prophets or even sent Jesus, who was literally the incarnation of the Creator himself, the religious hierarchy of the Jews wouldn't accept him because that means he was above all the rabbis. Even the people that followed that became Muhammad thought Jesus is a good prophet, but I, Muhammad, would be even better because I took over all the tribes and became the ruler of Mecca and Medina. The fact is, the sin of Cain is one of the most vile sins mankind can do because it says that God cannot bless another to bless me with the wisdom that he gives this person, like he gave wisdom to you to bless people on earth. So when people blaspheme literally the prophet or the witness like yourself, it's one of the most vile crimes that people can do. It's no different like it says, like Jesus said to me, like literally slitting the throat of the prophet is to not accept the words given in love to save your brothers and sisters. And when you do this book, or when we witness on the show right now, people say, why do you spend so much time talking about your faith? I say, look, I can talk about anti-aging and Fukushima and finances and other things, but unless you have a relationship with a creator God, everything else means nothing. And unless you, the people out there realize, too, that God has blessed us with a wisdom and a knowledge that transcends what they have ever experienced, but we want to bless them with it, we want to say, you need to know the love of the Creator, you need to know the wonder of the Creator like you do in your books, people will never get it, and they will do the sin of Cain. And I, I, I beg people, do not do the sin of Cain. Do not think, well, how do they? why are they so arrogant? Why do they think they know these things? Why should I get the books from BeforeUs.com and, and, and Jonathan Gray. Why does Dr. Deagle act like he knows it all? I don't know it all. But the things that God's given me like an ancient prophet are not my things. They're things that are the God's things. Just like the wisdom he gave you to actually be not only a skeptic, but also have the bright enough mind to actually go through and like a bloodhound pursue these truths and then write them down like it says in Habakkuk, let he who reads this on tables of stone run with it. So you want people all over the world to get the PDFs of your books and once they read them, get their Bible out, pursue God in prayer like a prey and run with it and ask God, prove God, you know, ask him to prove it in your life, your circumstances and understanding the world. And that's why this book, these books are so important, isn't it? Well, we need to hunger for these things, but first for them, and if we're not satisfied ever, except to learn, get more of it, get more of it. Right. Our God yeah. is so big, he's got so much to teach us. Right, and we have to actually give a hunger to those people who literally are starving, they don't know that they're starving, are thirsty, and they don't know to have a spiritual drink of the living waters. As Jesus says, come and sup with me. What he's saying is, <clears throat> I will give you spiritual food, and I'll give you a spiritual drink. Because you haven't, you don't even know you're starving and dehydrated spiritually, and God's going to provide it. But He provides it through His water carriers and His, His if you want to call His bus boys. We're like the bus boys in God's cafeteria, saying, you know, hey, we'll give you a spiritual meal. We'll give you, we'll build up your hope when you're dying of cancer, or your finances are shot, or your kids left you, or your relatives don't talk to you, or you know, your country is going under, like Portugal. 
despite all these things and the horrifying world we have facing us, our God is God, and he is still with us. That's what we need to give. This is not the year 2012 where they destroy hope. This is the year where hope is not Barack Obama's campaign slogan. Hope is the word that is strictly and 100% God's because he is the only hope, not Barack Obama or any other politician, by the way. It is the hope of the Most High changing us to be eternal beings because ultimately if we lose life, a physical life, if we lose our spiritual life, we have nothing. Absolutely. This is our great problem that it doesn't matter what we strive to achieve today or to gain for ourselves, it's ultimately gone the moment we die. Uh, I, I heard that on a surgery wall was hung a sign, the first two minutes of life are critical. But underneath, some wag had added, the last two were pretty dicey as well. Ah, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, as, as somebody else has put it, the most dangerous thing in the world is living. There's a 100% mortality rate. Yeah. And that's our need. Our problem is we, we need someone who has the power over death because without <clears throat> that power, without living on and on, everything that we've got for this short life is gone forever. And <clears throat> our only hope is our Creator. Let me give you a little story that's an actual true story. One of my uh, good friends was Dr. George Miroff, who's a Russian biochemist, one of the most brilliant biochemists in history. He worked at the uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York City. And <clears throat> 20 years ago, I brought my daughter there for testing in Austin, New York, north of New York City. And I got to become real good friends with George. And, of course, George was a Russian Jew. He was an atheist agnostic who was raised up in the Soviet Union, came to America many years uh, later, was one of the probably top biochemists on the planet. And he had an accident downtown Manhattan, and somebody hit him, and literally his heart stopped, and he went dead. And he said to me, he said, well, you're such a strong face, Dr. Deagle. Why do you believe that? He said, I was dead, and they brought me back after half an hour, and I came back, and they didn't. They were surprised because I take all these antioxidants, and my brain didn't die. But when I was out, all I saw was darkness. I didn't see anything. I said, well, didn't you say, George, that you don't believe in God? And didn't you say that there isn't anything after, de after death? And he said, yeah. I said, that's what you see when you're an atheist. And he looked at me, and he was quiet for like five minutes. He couldn't even speak. Mm -hmm. And then he realized he got all flushed, and he realized, like, damn. And I said, you're a Jew. Jew means praiser. And I said, do you know what that means? That means you've literally thrown away all your biochemistry, trying to save people's lives and fix their biochemistry and extend human lifespan, and yet... You're a spiritual being with a physical body, and you don't, you've you denied the very fact that the realm beyond is real. It's not imaginary. Because you saw darkness, that's what you see when you're an atheist. You see darkness. You don't see a pinpoint of light that becomes a tunnel, and all of a sudden you see Jesus. You see darkness because that's what your pottage is. That's what you receive from the dark side. You don't see receive the light of the Most High God. You receive falling in a tunnel, fading into non-existence forever, in a vortex of destruction. And he looked at me, and he was so paralyzed, he was speechless. Hopefully that will make you speechless out there. If you think that you know better than Dr. Deagle, you better think twice. You don't. Chapter 16, Jonathan, it's important uh, that you see stories. Explain more about the book and what, uh, in this chapter, what you're trying to get through to people. Okay. Now, according to the popular evolutionary theory, death is the means of eliminating the unfit and, and allowing the survival of the fittest. But as we've just been noticing today, death came into the world because <clears throat> of Adam's disobedience, and one man, Jesus Christ, the promised deliverer, has paid the penalty for it. So there's only one bridge to eternal life, and it does not involve preserving and repairing our present bodies. Uh, death of DSI is not an engineering or a biological problem. It's a moral problem, Dr. Bill. And so the only solution to death has been provided by the Creator himself. Now, 
The unchanged human heart is corrupted. It's not in harmony with God. It finds no joy in communion with Him. And an unchanged human being could not be happy in the new earth that's being planned. He would shrink from the company of those who love the one that came to rescue them. And if he were permitted to enter God's coming kingdom, it would be no joy for him because how, how could you be happy if you're, uh, you're selfish and everyone else around you is unselfish? It, it, your, your cord of, of unity would be not there. Your thoughts, your interests, your motives would be alien to those who are thanking God for their rescue. And uh, if I was like that, unregenerate, I'd be like a square peg in a round hole. It'd be a place of torture. So, I would long to be hidden from the one who is the centre of joy that everyone else is worshipping. So, really, it's not an arbitrary decree on the part of God that excludes the lost from his coming kingdom. They're shut out by their own unfitness and their own choice because they didn't want to be fit for his companionship. Exactly. So and what we have to do is show that, that there's no compulsion. <laughs> we're created free, but we, we, if we turn our back steadfast beyond our rescuer and his appointed plan for eternal life, we only have ourselves to blame. You know, I, I call it, the main thing is what I call the I and the we. And Jesus tried to say, though, he said, though you do it to the least of my brothers and sisters, you have done it to me. What he said is when you become empathic to your brothers and sisters on earth and you become empathic to every other life form on earth, then you're a true steward of the planet and you you become both not only an individual but a we because you think not just of yourself but the we of America, of New Zealand, of humanity. Uh, literally the coat of many colors, the prophecy of Joseph, hmm. where every skin color, every people... <laughs> had a prophetic, uh, if you want to call it unveiling, that meant that God's prophecy of the, of the coat of many colors in Joseph, you know, they talk about the technicolor coat, you know, they have the Broadway hit. Yep. It had nothing to do with the fancy coat and the fact that he was a special promised child and Joseph was going to eventually be the satrap of the pharaoh of Egypt. The coat meant that eventually God was going to incorporate, just like the outer cord of the, uh, of the, of the temple, every people every skin color, which is the representation of the coat of many colors. And what God is saying is, my love is not sufficient just for, quote, the two houses of Israel. It is sufficient for all mankind, and you can't, you know, exclude one of those threads of that coat, one color of that coat, one skin or people, that every people, black, Hispanic, white, yellow, every people is complete and makes up the coat of many colors. And people need to understand that that's the ultimate promise that God said is, I will bring peace to all the peoples of earth. We won't have a war going between, say, China and America, or a war between Africa and Europe. We won't have a war between Muslims and literally their brothers, the Jews and the Christians. That God is going to teach them that they are part of a coat of many colors. Well, that, that's a beautiful way to understand it. I, I think that's terrific. I, I like what you just said. Yeah, and I think what it does is it's important people to grasp that, that when they start to understand that this book and the, all the great books you do, and if they go back and reflect this and, and see it in the Bible, they start to say, you know, God's real. He cares for me. Because this is the year when you either seek God and, and have hope, or your hope will be dashed because the financial systems are crashing, Fukushima is poisoning the planet, we had the Mitsui a uh, chemical company blow up in Japan with 3,500 barrels of depleted uranium. If you just looked at the physical things going on in the world without the Creator, you would lose it. And the reason you can't lose it, even though you're in the fire like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is because our Creator says, though you go through these tribulations, not from them, no rapture, none of this foolishness that so many pastors teach, because they teach things because they act as a prophet when they have no prophetic gifting. They have no authority to say things prophetically. They say, well, this is part of what our church teaches. No, it doesn't. It's not in the Bible. Just like one of the things that they often teach is they teach that there is a, quote, singular antichrist. No, there's a spirit of antichrist or something that replaces Christ. There's two major leaders, a false prophet and a beast dictator. But nowhere in the Bible does it teach that there'll be, quote, an single antichrist, does it? Nowhere. No, no. 
It doesn't. But it, it, does, say, it, it does say about the beast and the false prophets, for sure. Exactly. And that's in there. And the reason that. is, I approach the, the Bible like a mathematician that's following every period, comma, every, every uh, corollary, every hypertext and subtext and everything else in the Bible, like examining a crystal with a polarized microscope to look for the fracture lines, etc., before you hit it with a proper hammer to, 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 to break that crystal of the diamond along the exact interface. And the fact is, if you look at the Bible as a super hyperdimensional book that interprets itself, as it says in Second Peter, which you've done brilliantly, is that you have to understand this book is made by a mind that transcends beyond time and space, a, a, literally a mind that is so supernatural you can't comprehend its brilliance. You can only see the reflected glory of God in the Bible. That's why even the, uh, you know, the, where the Jews try to interpret, uh, you know, using their uh, the Torah scrolls and so on, where they try to actually go back and use computers to try to figure out where the names are in the Bible and repeat letters, etc. These are just shadows of what God is. They're not going to be using it as a Ouija board. And God doesn't want to use the Bible as a Ouija board. He wants people to come to him in prayer. Come to him with their common sense and their brains. God didn't tell you to leave your brain at the door when you became a believer. He wants you to come to him as a son or daughter with all your neurons working, not influenced by drugs or alcohol, and thinking clearly and not toxically exposed to electronic drugs of bad media and bad ideas and bad universities that make you literally a blithering mechanical robot and a simulation of what it really truly is to be a human. That's what you're trying to teach them is that you're a, you have choice. Your professor doesn't tell you what's kind of politically or socially acceptable. And yet they try to turn it backward, just like it says in Revelation, say, they'll say that good is evil and evil is good. Like, you know, Obama, how dare you get upset about you know, the idea of gay marriage? How dare you get upset about the idea of us using predator drones to kill innocent people? How dare you when we back this or that happening going on? And it, and it cuts every way possible where evil is able to disguise itself and people have become intellectually and spiritually devoid of either common sense or decency. Yeah, yeah. It's terrible. I mean, uh, prophetically we're speaking right now that we are at the end of the age. We're going to bring, bring on lots of amazing prophetic people as well to, to kind of further push this story. We're going to have uh, uh, Jonathan Kahn will be coming on here uh, shortly. He'll, Jonathan will be on next week on a Tuesday. Uh, we'll be bringing on uh, Sid Roth. Uh, and of course, you'll be back regularly, Jonathan, because your books, I consider some of the most important works that when people read them, or if you want to get their unsaved relatives, get in their face, get them this books, buy them and say, look here, I bought this book for you. I've emailed it to you. Read it now. Don't tell me that I'm just a religious nutcase and why did I go over the edge and how, why did I get called Jesus? And why am I now, you know, like uh, finding excuses or I'm so fearful of the future? I'm not fearful of the future. You know, Moses said, he said, though you wipe my name from the book of life, save the people, God says. God couldn't wipe out his name. You know, that's one of the things God can't do. If you're righteous and you're serving God and a true son or daughter, that's one of the only things that God can't do. He can't, he won't permit himself to wipe your name out of the book of life. He won't. That's, right. that's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's it, it wonderful. Awesome. He won't do it. And he, even God, try, he tried to maneuver with God and say, you know, wipe out my name and save all the people. He says, you know, even though I call, I will call up children from the stones and the ground, I will create children. And he wouldn't accede to Moses offering himself up. So that's the kind of boldness you have to have if you want to live to the world that's coming. Economic, financial, environmental collapse, and a fire that's coming out of the earth physically, radioactive fire. But the thing that's going to save you is the fire of the Most High God and the Spirit. And this book, The Forbidden Secret, matching up with your Bible, is going to change your life and your heart. Get in the face of your relatives, take some spittle and some abuse, because it's the time for the men and women of spittle to stand up and become true witnesses of the Most High. And don't be worried about what people think of you. They need to know that you love them, even though you are a physical offense to those who are dying and don't know God. Thank you, Jonathan. Back tomorrow with Harley Schlanger and tonight, Hour 3 on Rents.